we are complicit in slow motion suicide to the extent that we do nothing. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to The Informed Citizen, where we discuss the biggest problems of our time with the experts and visionaries trying to solve them. This show is for the game changers, the world shapers who believe that to solve hard problems, we must be informed. I'm your host, Philip Lindholm, and I'm thankful to say this podcast is sponsored by Terry Wise & Associates, the premier real estate firm in the Northwest who believes that expertise matters. Our experts today are Sheriff Paul Pastor and attorney Chris Van Vechten, who are here to help us understand policing and criminal justice at a deeper level. I see these two as perfect conversation partners. Let me tell you just a little bit more about each of them. Paul Pastor entered law enforcement after completing two master's degrees and a doctorate at Yale University. He went on to a 40-year career in law enforcement that included 20 years as sheriff of Pierce County, Washington, before his recent retirement. Prior to serving as sheriff, Paul served as chief of police for the city of Everett, under sheriff for the Clark County Sheriff's Office, and in various positions with the Washington Criminal Justice Training Commission. Paul helped develop the FBI's first regional leads program and has served on multiple national and state committees. His recent journal publications address topics of police agency, ethics, and the mutual responsibilities of law enforcement and the public. He recently served as president of the board of directors for the FBI's National Executive Institute Associates. Chris Van Vechten is a well-respected attorney and small business owner. Chris graduated from the Seattle University School of Law and between 2010 and 2013 worked as a Rule 9 prosecutor and since 2014 has served as a public defender. He also currently works for the Puyallup Tribe's Legal Aid Program, providing legal services in both criminal and civil situations. Chris has served on numerous boards and commissions over the years and previously worked in Olympia, Washington as a legislative staffer and a campaign staffer for the Democratic Party. He has been active in several political campaigns, including his own runs for school board, precinct committee officer, and the Tacoma City Council. Paul, Chris, thank you for being here. I'm so excited for this episode. I feel like we can have a really important conversation that can help people understand these things at a deeper level. As you know, public safety and criminal justice are some of the most contentious issues of our time. There is deep mistrust between the police and the public they are meant to serve, and people on all sides don't feel safe. Add to that that here in Washington from 2020 to 2022, violent crime is up 81.9%. We hit a state record for homicides in 2022, and we're now the eighth most dangerous state in the country. Paul, looking back on 40 years of public service and criminal justice and, and working as a sheriff in, in, in all kinds of capacities, um, how did we get here? How did we get to this place of mutual distrust? Um, it's interesting. We um, were able to publish an article in Police Chief Magazine uh, a few months ago about that, uh, uh, trust and the importance of trust. Um, uh, Two things um, I think need to be said. We spoke a little beforehand about um, uh, about the criminal justice system needs to be two things at once. And if we swing one way or the other too far, um, we have a problem. It needs to be fair, equitable, and constitutional. It needs to be a legal system, a legally controlled system. That's important. That's what separates America from what we don't want. At the same time, it has to be effective. And to the extent that we overemphasize one or the other, um, then we generate mistrust. You can generate mistrust by abusing citizens. And as we've uh, discussed earlier, that has happened. And when it happens, law enforcement needs to do a better job of calling it out, not just the public. Also, um, News media and the public need to understand that what you see on television is the exception. Um, you see the, the, the terrible treatment of um, name, the, uh, name the individual from George Floyd to, to who, whoever. And you say, well, that must be typical of what happens in law enforcement. If we say that, then we mischaracterize it. Uh, because the news doesn't cover the airplane that doesn't crash or the house that doesn't burn. It covers the exception. We have to earn trust by behaving correctly. We have to earn trust by being effective. And we need to focus on both of those. 
Do you think the public is wrong to have some mistrust around their police force? When you find mis- reason for mistrust, then then you should do it. But you should find out how characteristic that is. I mean, it, it's a little like, you know, flip, flip a racial coin on that. So, I mean, my brother was shot in 1980 by a Hispanic gang member. So um, I hope I don't go around saying all Hispanic people are gang members who shoot people. Um, thank you, I know better than that. Not even all Hispanic gang members shoot people, thank you very much. It's a little more complex than that. We simplify things too extremely. We have to broaden our approach to things, effective and legal and equitable. So I'm hearing you say when the public sees one bad instance of something gone wrong, of a police officer doing the wrong thing, it gets writ large, and the other thousand times that that police officer did the right thing is forgotten. Is that what I'm hearing? That's true, but I will. Uh, there's enough of a social science uh, uh, part of me left over from uh, years past that, yeah, there probably is uh, more um, misconduct than that single incident. And body cameras have begun to multiply evidence of those incidents. And thank you, I like body cameras. And God bless the people I worked with. My personnel liked body cameras. Made it real easy to do is deal with citizen complaints. Let's watch the movie. But the greater percentage of, um, of police citizen encounters you don't hear about because they don't rise to the level of people objecting to them. And that's changed and improved, I believe, over the past 40 years. Sorry, Chris. I, I no, I, I, it's, you know, you know, it's um, a lot of things that I agree with. There are, there are also some facts that, you know, it, it doesn't matter whether or not it's true, how people feel. It's just how they feel. And I'm I'm trying to think about myself and my own evolution of how I've perceived law enforcement over my life. You know, my first perception was very negative because uh, when I was an infant, I don't remember this at all, but two men broke into my um, parents' house in Connecticut and robbed them. And they later got caught. And it turned out they were both off-duty police officers. And that experience was so jarring for my family that it was one of the reasons we moved to the West Coast was to get away from what we thought was a corrupt town with a corrupt police department. We did not feel safe living with that um, reality. Um, So I grew up believing that all police officers were were crooks. I I completely believed it. But as I matured and entered the real world and, you know, moved to Hilltop and lived in a community where law enforcement was very necessary for me, my um, opinion shifted. And eventually I became a prosecutor and worked with them. And I saw things that that some police officers did that I was very sympathetic to, and some police officers I thought were heroes who had, um, and I, to this day, will see through the body cameras, a police officer provide mouth-to-mouth service to one of my clients who was overdosed, for example, uh, which I, as a public defender, don't know how, if I saw a homeless person unconscious on the street, would I rush to them and provide mouth-to-mouth? Probably not, in all honesty. So the fact that someone's willing to expose themselves to that in that capacity is truly heroic. I also have seen things happen um, that are um, reprehensible and need to be called out. I think what happened is that um, for a long time there was one narrative and anyone who suggested otherwise was considered crazy or insane. And that narrative, the pool of voices has been expanded. But my frustration, th- this is this is where I am with it. I, I can remember in 2014 as a public defender going to a, a WADA conference, Washington Defender Association. And we were told by the speaker, whose name I forget, that if the general public knew what was going on in the criminal justice system, they would be demanding change in favor of our clients. But the problem was we public defenders had been trained not to talk about this at the risk of exposing attorney-client confidentiality. And and so the result was that there was only one narrative the public was always hearing. And so we decided to start talking about legal financial obligations, about bail reform, about the collateral consequences of these convictions, about for-profit treatment providers that were setting our clients up to fail and making a ton of money without solving anything. But eventually, I can remember going back to one of these conferences where a speaker um, came up and told us, public defenders, that we needed to, quote, stop fetishizing the Constitution because it was an antiquated document written by a bunch of dead white slave owners that had nothing to do with the real world. And I remembered listening to this and thinking it takes a hell of a lot of privilege to think that way. My clients believe absolutely in the Constitution. It's oftentimes the only thing they have. They believe in the right to confront their accuser, the right to a speedy jury trial, uh, the right to an attorney at public expense, 
uh, the right to be free from searches and seizures. Where is this guy coming off from? But at a certain point, that narrative, the people who were not at the front of this issue, somehow, either at least in the media or in public policy, took over and it became a police abolitionist movement. But as you say, I don't think the general public is aware of that because those aren't the stories. The time when an officer did right doesn't make the news, generally speaking. And I think that is unfair and is part of the problem. What do you think is the best way for the police to restore uh, public trust? Making sure that body cameras continue to be fully funded and because um, we eventually will go into a budget shortfall and that will be, it'll be tempting to get rid of that. I don't think we can let that happen because I do think public... You asked, should the public trust law enforcement? As a public defender, I, I think we have a duty not to, at least when serving on a jury, because there's a presumption of innocence. And this whole system, the whole Bill of Rights is set on a presumption that government, when given power, will abuse it. But um, we shouldn't necessarily view police as out to get people. So this raises something I think is really important for this conversation, which is you described how it's it's kind of an adversarial system when a jury member is sitting in the box and they're being asked to trust a police officer. In some sense, you two could be seen as adversaries. One's in charge of putting folks away. The other one's in charge of defending them. Do you see yourselves as adversaries? I don't see myself. I don't think his job is to put people away. I think his, his job is to bring people to a jury to let them decide whether they should be put away or to a prosecutor to see if charges are done. Perfect. Perfect. So I'm curious to see, do you agree with that description? And can you describe his I th- job? I think it's more, I think it's more general than that. And you say it's adversarial and it, it should be adversarial. Thank you. In a, in a trial context, people deserve this man's protection and this man's advocacy. People deserve my people saying, I believe this guy stole the car, and we don't like people stealing a car. His job is important. Uh, we cannot diminish, even as we try to set the, uh, the, the place right between uh, effectiveness and, and fairness, we, we, can't, um, uh, we can't badmouth the idea that somebody who is advocating for the fairness things, even if he doesn't personally believe it, is doing something wrong because that's the system that, that we have. It's an adversarial common law system. And I have no problem with that at all. I don't think my job is to arrest people in jail. I told my people that their ultimate goal was to do justice and undo injustice. So there are times when they should be, that guy stole the car, and that guy needs to uh, be held accountable for stole, stealing the car. And there are times that they need to be, you know, he did steal a car, but he did it under duress. And if I don't point that out to, I'm not giving uh, to uh, the criminal justice system, I'm not giving the whole story. So it is more complex than just lock up and let go. And an adversarial aspect of it is, is not only uh, not a bad thing, it's an honorable thing. I, I do not see my job as here to promote the normalization of rape, murder, and mayhem. That's uh, So the, I am not an abolitionist, or I'm not here to say that it is okay to do these things. My experience has been that about 30% of the people in this system are flat-out innocent. About 30% are flat-out, as they say, guilty, or worse. And about 40% are somewhere in between. So it's not enough to just say to defend the guilty. Well, they might have committed a crime, but they're being overcharged. That's a lot of what I do as well. So um, my job is ultimately to hold the state accountable. Um, you know, it, ultimately, a jury trial is a duel between the government and the individual. Well, who do you think, generally speaking, has more power in that situation, the government or the people they prosecute, right? So the only way that this duel can be fair is if we have disproportionate burdens placed on the state. And that's why we have the presumption of innocence, the burden of production, uh, the fact that my client doesn't have to testify and yet can be completely exonerated without having to explain themselves, right? So I believe in all of those concepts 100%. I think that that's my job. I am an auditor of the process, ultimately, as is the jury. They have to, you know, they are part of the burden. This is one thing I always ask during jury selection. Who here is committed to being a burden for the state in this trial? You have to be committed to being a problem to these people. This is not, the law is, most jurors always say, I would be a great juror because I'm fair and impartial. Great, but the law isn't fair and it isn't impartial. The law requires you to presume my client is innocent. Not that he may be innocent, but that he is innocent. And I don't mean technically innocent. I mean factually innocent, as innocent as Jesus Christ when he was on trial. That is what the system is asking of people. 
I had a case um, a couple of years ago where, um, a terrible case to be on, um, my client, black man, and two other black men went to a gas station in Federal Way and started asking people there, are you from Russia? And when they said yes, they shot him. They shot three people. Uh, no one died, but three people were shot. This didn't get a lot of attention because it happened in April of 2020, and we had a little-known event called the COVID pandemic going on at that time, and it, we were in a shelter order. So what media published about it, they didn't mention what the motive was about this. But it happened at a gas station, so it was completely caught on video. My client was caught less than a day later. Uh, his firearm was under the seat of the car. Uh, the police had gotten a search warrant to check the cell phone, saw that there was messages before this happened showing that this was a premeditated thing so you couldn't claim self-defense it was a terrible case to be on what should a defense attorney do in that circumstance to get someone out of all of that when there's witnesses there's videos there's guns there's admissions i think his girlfriend admitted to what he had done because she'd been there as well or been there shortly afterwards sometimes your job is just to ensure fairness right Make sure they're not being overcharged, for example. No, and, and, and sentencing is a big part of it, too. Making sure that you understand, you know, what sort of background this person came from, why they did this, whether they were pressured to do this, whether they were under the influence of something, whether they have underlying mental health. You know, it's... Should juries... Sorry to interrupt. Should juries have more control over the sentencing part? Because right now they don't. Unfortunately, in a jury trial, a lot of evidence is withheld from the jury. So it would be administratively very difficult, if nothing else, to do this, because then we would have to have a second trial where we would have to bring up after, okay, now you've convicted him. Now you get to know about the 46 other cases he's been here before. Now you get to hear about his prior, you know, we'd have to have experts come forward. To All test the prejudicial him. evidence that didn't come into trial now does. Right, but also a lot of other things that the judge deemed were irrelevant, but, but the defense wanted in as well. Um, you know, stuff of that nature. Um, you know, for example, in Washington State, um, it is if a woman accuses someone of having raped her, it is not lawful to present evidence that she's previously been found to have not to have lied about these things with other men before because of our rape shield laws. So a jury doesn't get to hear that this person is a serial accuser. It, it's a great idea in the abstract, but in practice, it would probably be very difficult. You know, Paul, how do you think about sentencing? and overcharging, is that a concern? Actually, it's a concern maybe in a direction that people would be uh, surprised. William Bratton, who is a former um, police chief or commissioner rather in New York City, former chief in Los Angeles, uh, fairly smart, fairly progressive kind of guy, has coined a phrase called the perpetual first time offender. And um, we get people and um, again, I realize that the, the the biggest, most extreme kinds of cases uh, get the attention. Uh, but uh, the kid who um, at gunpoint um, robs his third car um, and is proven to do it, and people say, well, you know, he's a misunderstood kid. Yeah, but there's a guy, another guy who was driving the car who had a gun in his face and was worried about his life. And the car was stolen and the kid raced off and ran from police and uh, rammed the police car and on and on and on and on. Um, people ought to have a chance to be interrupted in a series of bad behaviors, and especially kids. And I've heard a good story about you, sir, that, uh, that suggests that, that you agree with the idea that we need to be able to interrupt kids in a direction toward a criminal career before they, we need to stop excusing them until they do some, uh, until they get to the point they do something that's unexcusable. And rather than me saying, yeah, I'm a retired boy delinquent, I broke windows with a rock um, as, as a kid, um, but if I'd murdered somebody as a kid, that would follow me through my life. Um, I get to be sheriff having broken windows with a rock uh, with Pomona, Pomona Police Department in California uh, arresting me. At some point, we need to say to not just kids, but other people, excuse me, this is serious. And you may have a lot of problems in your life, but you're going in a direction that's not good. I don't want to see you next year on a worse charge or the year after that. We make a lot of concern about uh, a punishment and sentencing based on, um, based on general deterrence. Will it keep other people from doing this? General deterrence says, um, I'm not going to do it because um, Johnny Glotz uh, got prison time. Specific individual deterrence says, Johnny Glotz has stolen 
X number of times or stuck a gun in somebody's face and stolen a car X number of times. Um, keeping Johnny Glotz away from cars he can steal and away from, um, you know, stealing, stealing other things or hurting other people is a good idea because the effective part of the criminal justice system is important. I realize people have substance abuse problems. I realize people have uh, mental illness problems. But if that's used as a, oh, so we can't do anything about them, um, so uh, they can't understand the, the uh, charges against them, so what we'll do is let them go and so they can throw more people down the escalator in the public, uh, 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 public transit area. No, let's get real. Let's find people and identify people who are getting convicted multiple times and say they're trying to tell us something. I think I told you earlier, my brother was shot in 1980 in Southern California. He was shot by a Latino gang member. Um, this is the third guy uh, that um, uh, this guy had been convicted of shooting. He'd been accused of shooting many more uh, than that. Um, and he had served a life sentence in California in seven years. Um, maybe my brother would not have been shot had somebody gotten a hint that this guy is going to do this again and again and again. Um, I was on a sentencing guidelines commission for a while. And one of the things that amazed me was some of the social science that got brought forward. Um, for example, neurologically, supposedly, people aren't fully mature in their brain until they're 25 years old. I object to that just because I've lived in another. I lived in, in Latin America where the 13 year olds are easily as mature as our 16 year olds. This is to a certain degree, we delay adulthood and we delay responsibility in this society. But I've heard the Houston Sconers argument. So, yeah. Well, well, you, and I've made it myself. <laughs> <laughs> well, it, it, it's fair to make. If right. it, it, that, that's part of your job. I don't, I don't resent that. But uh, I'm sitting there being the naysayer saying, wait a minute. Uh, you know, not very many people who are 25 years old get into trouble. And even fewer of them get into serious trouble. And even fewer of them in the course of their 25th year, 24th year, 20th, do it repeatedly. So exactly, exactly how is this exonerating, even if it's true? This topic couldn't be more relevant, right? Because we're seeing juvenile crime in our local community skyrocket, especially through car thefts and other things. And, and some folks are arguing we're seeing a different kind of criminal now, a brazen criminal now that we didn't maybe didn't see 10, 15 years ago. Is that true? This, this generation was portrayed by the adults, for lack of any other. We went in 2020 from talking about tuition-free college to debating whether or not kindergarten was essential. They, they were denied friends. They were denied libraries. They were denied parks. They were told... School was not essential because everything in life is a birth lottery anyways. Um, to justify what was done to this generation and the lack of investment and the lack of prioritizing of them while we had Mariners games open, while we had casinos open, while we had cruise ships open, this just lack of delay has, I think, significantly damaged this generation of kids. And what we saw is that they turned to other things to do. And we saw a hell of a lot of kids Every Friday, they would steal another car. They would just get released at the scene when they got caught. This was fun. They would rack it all up. And now they're being asked to be held accountable after they've you know, racked up 18 counts as a first-time offender because there wasn't an intervention earlier on. How severe did that intervention need to be? You and I would probably debate that. And there are also still, I, you know, I'm defending juveniles now from minor in possession. I think that I, of, of all the reforms that came out of 2020, I'm amazed we did not decriminalize minor in possession. I think it should have been made into a, a fraction, like a speeding ticket, um, because the only places where this happens to get charged, it seems like, is at house parties in the country where no one's honestly getting hurt or anything of that nature. And there's often a parental supervisor who, yes, is giving alcohol to a child, but I consider that safer than the alternative. Um, and I'm still defending kids for you know fights at school. Um, the sort of thing that you and I grew up with and was pretty normal. I think that that could be dealt with internally through suspensions, expulsions. It doesn't need to result in criminal convictions, I think. But there are things that should and don't. Right. You stick a gun in somebody's face, you steal their yeah. car, and, they, and you say, well, this time we're not going to put you in juvie overnight. We're going to send you straight home. The perpetual first-time offender, the forgiveness um, movement, if you will, is doing a disservice not only to the public and effectiveness, but it's doing a disservice because it doesn't send a message 
especially to juveniles. You want to create adult criminals? Then keep forgiving juveniles for escalating problems. Let's talk about a case that's very important in this discussion. And I think you were sheriff during the Houston Sconers time when that incident happened, the Hilltop incident with the four kids went trick-or-treating. Do you remember this? You know, I, I don't. Help okay, I, I was living in Hilltop at the time. This was 2012. Four kids, the oldest of which was 16, the youngest of which were 12, went around and robbed a bunch of trick-or-treaters and their parents at gunpoint, okay. right? Now I, now I and, and they they stole their cell phones, they stole their candies, they stole their wallets, and it took a long time for the police to get them because Hilltop has a lot of trick-or-treaters. It's an easy place to do. The suspects were kids wearing Halloween costumes, so the police were looking around trying to figure out which ones are they. And before they finally got caught, they caught, you know, they had robbed like 40, 50, 60 people. I forget the exact number, but each one came with a firearm sense enhancement. And so we had 12 year old kids getting charged as an adult, getting 120 year sentences for each, you know, and that's what resulted in the Houston Sconers mm -hmm. case that basically said the kids under the age of 25, their lack of development and stuff of that nature needs to be taken into account with sentencing because it's not practical to give I may be exaggerating here, it might have been 60, 70 year sentence, but for a 12 year old under those facts, that seemed unduly harsh. What would you think about that? Um, I would think that um, somehow I managed not to rob anybody with um, uh, on Halloween with a, with a gun when I was a kid. I broke windows. Right. Okay. I was, a, I was, a, I'm a retired boy delinquent, terribly serious delinquent, but it was driven home to me. Mm hmm. Um, and not a 25 year sentence, but that's wrong. You're in trouble for doing that. Mm -hmm. If we get overly concerned with forgiveness in those, not 60 years, but saying, excuse me, we got to find out what makes you tick that made you stick a gun in somebody's face who is, you know, eight years old and take their candy. You know, if, if you grabbed their candy bag and ran away, you know, that's that's the kind of uh, scolding situation. Right. You take a lethal weapon and hold it to my kid's head right. and take his candy. And to be clear, it's one gun among four kids. So, you know, you understand it's a group thing here. They're all accomplices and they're all being charged the right. same. But Right. Paul, what do you think we do with those four kids? Um, first of all, um, we separate them. And then we sort them out and say, what's going on with this kid? You know, we get kids who are released to their parents, and that may be the worst place to have them released. They're kids that are grown in families that, that uh, it, I'll, I'll tell you another war story, if you will. I was under sheriff in Clark County. We got a call for a knife fight, uh, which uh, is not a good thing to re respond to. Um, I was the second unit there. The knife fight was over. The neighbor said, yeah, that's Carl over in Unit C, and Carl is really... <laughs> He, he's always into something. So we go to Unit C and knock on the door and we say, hi, is Carl here? And his girlfriend or wife, very young woman, probably late teens at the oldest, with a newborn kid, um, says, well, he's not here. And then we hear him here and we say, pardon me, we know he's here. Carl, we need you to step out here. We need to see your hands, okay? We need you to turn around and be handcuffed. We heard that you were involved in attacking somebody with a knife. Can you tell us what, what is going on here? Um, in the apartment were three Nazi flags, holes punched in the, holes punched in the, the plasterboard wall, um, dishes broken. We worry that 20 years from now, if we come back, that little baby will be holding a little baby and her husband, boyfriend, whatever, will be um, in a knife fight, and um, my grandson will be arresting um, this person. There are patterns that we need to talk about intervening in for the good of kids, and that's going to take money. And that we talked about um, how people don't like to spend tax money, but they like things nice and orderly and non-criminal. Yeah, we're going to pay for it one way or another. So the question is, how do we spend those dollars? Is it up front? Is it on the back end? What does that look like? It's a combination of both. I mean, like, I, I, you know, on the one hand, as we were talking about with the car thefts here, yes, you need to have law enforcement intervene before the guy racks up 18 charges for stealing cars. On the other hand, if we had prioritized schools during the pandemic, if we prioritized infrastructure for young people, would this have happened? Where did the spike come from, if not the disinvestment in young people? So let's lean into this now. How do we, you kind of see this generation as being... Um, they got screwed, yeah. They, 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 they may screwed. have gotten screwed, but I, I can't. How do we hold them accountable now? I think that there needs to be 
a common cultural experience for them. And it used to be that we had school was the common cultural experience. And to a certain degree in this country, we had military service. I don't think we have a common experience anymore. And I think that, that you know, while I, I don't believe that we should be trying to make everyone the same in thought or experience, we should be able to talk to people who come from a different philosophy or world than us. And I'm, I'm not sure that this generation is capable of that. Let me let me jump in on one thing, um, and I think I disagree with you on this. I don't think we can put the whole burden on uh, disassociation or lack of socialization of kids. And here's why. There were millions of kids who were exposed to the same thing and aren't stealing cars. Sure. The way they're different is they have informal strings attached family, community, adults they interact with, and so forth. And uh, those informal strings and expectations that they were given for behavior Mm -hmm. are an important part of this. There are millions of poor, discriminated against, poorly educated kids that turn out just fine, thank you. Why is that? And it's because they've been reinforced in their hearts and their heads to do the right thing. And when they don't do the right thing, they've been called to answer for not doing the right thing by parents, by teachers, by by whatever. That kind of call to answer, that kind of strings, informal social control, uh, pointy-headed um, uh, social scientists call it, um, is, is what we need to talk about getting back into communities. Now, there may have been less than that, but to suggest that a generation is going you know, to hell because um, uh, they were desocialized it doesn't hold up with numbers. Well, it's, it's more than that. I mean, for a lot of people, school was the center of everything they have. If you come from poverty, if you come from broken homes, this is where you were getting lunch. This is where you were getting medical services. This is where someone cared about you. You look at the homeless population, one out of two of them came out of foster care, right? You know, they, they don't have family to fall back on. They may not have a clear sense of what family is. The people living in the tents become their family, become their identity. How do you get them out of that world? School was the answer for a long time. For my generation, all problems could be solved with school. And that was unfair to school and teachers. You know, teen pregnancy, more education. Uh, childhood obesity, more education. Uh, bullying, more education. You know, we created this situation where whenever there was a problem that was too big for the, pol- for the, for the adults, politicians would push it onto the schools and then blame the teachers for not being accountable. It was unfair, but it was the program we had in place. And then that just collapsed and there was nothing to fill that gap. And there has to be a connection between that and I think the spike we're seeing. You are absolutely correct that there are people who nonetheless survive all of that and go on to do great things. But one of the things I've noticed with my clients, and I think you said it a few moments ago, was that um, for my clients, oftentimes the worst thing they ever did in life was have a child because they themselves are still children and they're not equipped to take care of themselves. And now they've brought someone into their own dysfunction. I had a case once where a 12 year old girl was charged with hitting her mom. I asked her, why did she, you know, because, because her mom wouldn't give her her SSI money and I asked the 12 year old, why are you on SSI? And she said, cause I'm ADD and I lost it. Cause so am I <laughs> right. You know, but, um, they've been given a label and that label has become their identity. And now she herself is a, is, is a, is a parent and she's raising a kid with a similar identity and a label. And it just becomes, multiple generations of dysfunction, school was the idea to break that. Now, it's not a fail-safe. Teddy Roosevelt famously said that a man without a degree might rob a train car, but if he has a college education, he can steal the whole railroad, right? You know, there's, <laughs> there is not necessarily a moral salvation that comes with an education, but there is structure and socialization. So I think we can see an intersection here. We've mentioned homelessness. We've mentioned mental illness. We've mentioned drugs and public safety. And I think those all those issues can find a home or an intersection when that first responder shows up to the homeless person on the side of the road who is a threat to public safety, has a mental illness, on drugs. How do we how do we work with that person? There's not one answer for that. <laughs> I agree. There's there, there's not one answer. But part of the answer, uh, I think, is we we talked about this a little earlier. Um, there are people who say don't interrupt their freedom. You know, it is important not to violate their rights. Um, And I think I I referenced a book uh, earlier in our conversation, and and the book is uh, The Paradox of Liberty. 
uh, and that is that freedoms always exist if they're going to continue to exist within constraints. In dialogue with other freedoms. And, and, right. And, and they bounce against other people's freedoms as well. Um, we have, um, uh, unfortunately, um, and I said this uh, before you arrived, there's this fault line of libertarianism. And there's left-wing libertarianism that says, you know, we have to let people do what, what they want and make their own choices. And there's right-wing libertarianism uh, that says, don't raise my taxes, don't get the government involved. And the fault line goes right through homeless camps. Mm -hmm. um, and I think we need to do two things. We need to say, yeah, it's going to cost some money. As you talked about, you can do nothing and expect the same, or maybe you can get some um, change. Maybe it's important to say, hi, as I said before, if you can't be tried in a court of law because you don't understand the charges against you, why do we assume that if I say, do you want to go to a homeless shelter or do you want temporary housing? You say, no, I choose not to. Um, or you want some treatment on your drug stuff. No, I choose not to. Um, maybe uh, the recriminalization of drugs, if it's done right, it doesn't start another war on drugs. It says, hi, criminal justice system can be a collection point uh, for people who are addicted and can work with the civil justice system to try to get people off drugs and not be dope sick. You made a reference earlier that um, your, some of your clients were said, well, we're going to get you off drugs and you can't Cold do anything. Yeah. You get dope sick. Um, uh, Patty Jackson started, a, 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 what was it, Suboxone mm -hmm. thing in the jail. Maybe we need to tell people hi. At some point, the third or fourth time you're offered help and you refuse it, and you're causing uh, s civil uh, disruption and degradation and, and, and so forth, it's time to say, you don't have choice this time. I'm sorry. I realize that it is not, uh, we shouldn't never take away the choice just kind of uh, frivolously. But we have a problem we're not solving by both allowing choice and not investing in different choices and different control modalities. So I'm hearing you say we should be using our mandatory inpatient facilities. I believe we should. And, and I believe that th there's, a, there's probably a, a, a union. Uh, there's more of a union than I think people think be between defense attorneys and, and, and cops and things to say, um, you know, maybe we can get your client uh, so I don't see him in three months doing the same crime. What would it take? Now, I know we can't. Does that conversation happen? Oh, it happens with prosecutors all the time, and particularly today. I mean, when I started out as a prosecutor, there was more of a war on crime mentality than appears now. We, we, you know, literally had ranked prosecutors based on how many years in prison they racked up over a year for, you know, people. And that was very dysfunctional, but that is not, generally speaking, the culture that exists right now in law enforcement. One of the problems I, you know, ideologically we agree on this thing. The problem is I'm skeptical that we honestly know how to solve addiction I view addiction primarily as a mental health problem, and I don't feel comfortable punishing people for being mentally ill. I wish there was a class or a magic pill that would actually solve this thing, but it depends on how we define what getting cured means. For example, in Muckleshoot land, for example, there's code says, tribal court, that all cases are presumed to be solved with a therapeutic sentence except for violent crimes and sex crimes. But they're not joking about that. They want total sobriety. You have to go for a complete year of total sobriety of everything, alcohol, tobacco, marijuana, um, um, heroin. What is the scary thing right now? Um, fentanyl. Fentanyl, thank you. Fentanyl, all that stuff of that nature. And if you don't do that, um, the whole process starts all over again. To go to jail in Muckleshoot land, you have to, as a defendant, ask to go to jail and you have to pay for it yourself. So what they want is for you to be permanently under their supervision and until you're complete cured. And that's damn near impossible in my experience. It, what we can do is make people more functional addicts so that they are still using, but they're not committing crimes. They're more in control of themselves. Part of the problem we talk about here is did we really cure someone if they're now on buprenorphine because they're still using a controlled substance but they're functional. And so what is the difference between addiction and dependence, right? Those are, those are two conflicting ideas we have here. So when we tell people that we expect you to change, we need to have an honest idea of how to do that. Because I've seen 
a lot of fluctuations in theory of how to do that. I've also seen a lot of very predatory treatment uh, programs out there that make a hell of a lot of money making a lot of promises on what they could do to solve everything from domestic violence to substance abuse to mental health. It is it is a very complicated issue. But I think when we talk about the homeless, you know, I, running for office, I, I remember that you know, everyone I talked to at the door basically said the same thing, that they wanted a solution that was both humane and effective. And I would say to them, well, if it's not effective, it can't be humane because this is not humane. I've lost track of how many of my clients have set themselves on fire in these tents, how many have been hit by cars stumbling into the street at night, how many have been the victims of severe violence. Two of my clients this year that I know of have been killed in these camps, one of whom I looked him up, had been homeless since 1996 wow. in Tacoma. How can someone be homeless for 28 years if they are seriously looking for services. That is extremely frustrating to me. I, I, we hear endless excuses of, well, there's a shortage of services, you know, or the services don't meet them where they are. All of that is true, but it's hard for me to stand here and say 28 years, nothing worked. You never, you know, tried anything of that nature. So I'm hearing Paul say when that first responder shows up that mandatory inpatient should be a tool in the toolbox. Yes. What else should be in the toolbox? <sighs> well, okay. Um, a lot of my clients who are homeless, they technically have a home, but they're not allowed to go home because home is where the crime took place, like in domestic violence cases. In 2022, we had 20,000 no contact orders issued across this county, both civil and criminal. It is very difficult to get someone housed if they have a pending criminal charge, no matter how expensive the rent is or cheap, because who will pay the rent if they get taken into custody, right? And landlords look at that. And, you know, some people think, well, they'll go to the shelters of the tiny homes. But the problem is those things receive grant funding that says no one who's accused of X, Y, or Z. And even if they don't, the people who operate those facilities fear, well, what if we take this guy in and he assaults a staff member or fellow resident? I don't want us to get sued. So they end up in the camp for lack of a clear legal alternative. There's nowhere for them to go. Well, very few options. I mean, you know, it's it's more difficult than it should be. One thing that I think our community could do is come up with a program that tells landlords, look, if you take a risk on this guy who hasn't been convicted of anything yet and he does go to jail, we'll pay the rent while you go through the unlawful detainer action. That way the landlord isn't losing any money. Um, my clients can focus on their underlying issues instead of where they could sleep at night. And we'd actually have some accountability with how our money is being spent because this is one of those ideas where nothing actually gets spent unless a landlord actually takes a risk, a guy actually gets housed out of these tents and then actually goes to jail and thus, you know, an indemnification is required. So you want to have a situation where there's both um, opportunity and accountability from all. And we don't currently have that. Is transitional housing a, an option here? I don't know if you could get insured for that. I mean, if someone had set fire, I mean, like, I'm not saying absolutely not, but I think that that's a hell of a barrier. Because there is transition housing for folks who have just come out of. Yeah, there, I mean, but they're, they're, so like sex offender transitional housing, it's there, but you've got like, you know, imagine a room like this that has, each wall has multiple bunk beds up there. And so you could have like, you know, eight people to a room, for example. Um, it And some of whom have severe problems. It might make you feel uncomfortable and unsafe. And you might opt out for that. I you don't, might rather be in your car. Is what. <laughs> maybe, you know, I mean, sometimes, you know, all you can do is tell someone, look, your felony is, is not your future. You're extremely lucky that you've got a family that wants to, you know, um, take this, you know, give you this life raft. You need to take it until you're at a better place in life. And I wish I told you that, you know, a light bulb just goes on and, and then they say, you're right, Chris. And they get in a car and they go to Georgia. That's just not how this works. But we can't normalize this reality. The people who are treating these is like, an endangered species or as a, um, you know, that this is their natural place to just be living in, in, in a tent is, is, is it's, it's cruel and it's not helping anything. But I think the one thing that you and I would both agree with is that we need to get a lot better at data collection because homeless people move around and the data doesn't get shared between communities. In an ideal world, you'd have social workers out there with an iPad. They would just do a thumbprint on the iPad. Up would come this person's file. This is Paul Pasture. Paul has a aunt who lives in Lakewood. She says that he can come live with her if he, she first does 30 days of detox. Paul, why hasn't this happened yet? So we can tell the difference between um, excuses and uh, systemic failures. Because right now we, we can't. We have to take a lot of, you know. And there, and there are libertarian objections to that yep. that would say, yep. wait a minute, this is big brother. Um, and um, there are times when we have to be very careful of that. But again, if we could stop somebody from jumping over a bridge by identifying them and and uh, convincing them not to based on information that we glean, mm -hmm. uh, we would do that in an instant. Mm -hmm. We are 
complicit in slow motion suicide to the extent that we do nothing. I would more or less agree with that. So we have these many issues. We have homelessness. We have mutual mistrust between the public and the police that are meant to serve them, drugs, all these things. Let's talk about some of the solutions. Is community policing a solution? Can you tell us more about what that is and, uh, and does it work? I would say it is uh, part, partly interacting with, consulting the community. I think you mentioned something about knowing who's who in the neighborhood mm -hmm. uh, and who their families are. Um, that's a very good thing, and that's a very good way to police. It's an excellent way to police. It can it protect neighborhoods, it can protect people, um, and it is incredibly expensive. And if we spend one dollar, are we getting one dollar safer? And and that's that's fair to ask. And I can't I can't answer that in an abstract. It depends. If community policing is you have a group hug meeting in a school gymnasium once a year, <laughs> uh, no, you're wasting your dollars, even though you're just buying cheap pizza. Uh, to do it. Um, community policing uh, never went this direction, and it should have. It should emphasize that as a police officer, I owe you a tremendous amount of obligation. I should be concerned, worried about how you're doing, how your family's doing. I should be knowledgeable. I should be working to prevent as well as protect. Trust requires that I be able to trust you and you trust me. Now, maybe not initially in an initial contact, but a true trusting relationship is a reciprocal relationship. You have to have money in the game. You can't be a community that sits in the bleachers and cheers or boos the cops. You have to be a responsible citizen who is willing to step forward and say, here's the things I respect and I expect. I expect to be treated decently. Uh, I expect my rights to be uh, looked after, and I expect that um, you're going to protect and, and prevent crime from happening to me. Public safety isn't a consumer good. It's a civic duty. Police officers have a high, a high obligation. Defense attorneys have a high obligation. Prosecutors have a high obligation. But we act toward the public like, oh, and, um, you know, um, say nice things about us and wave to us, but uh, don't get educated about issues, don't get concerned, and whatever you do, don't invest money and expect outcomes. This whole podcast is about getting folks informed, about having the conversations we need to have. And we actually just did an episode where we talked about how important it is that the public be not only informed, but involved in their community. But what do you say to the person who says, look, I have four kids, I have two jobs, I'm just trying to put food on the table. It sounds like you're asking more of me, and I have nothing to give. Um, and you know what? That's, that's, that's a fair response. Uh, but you do have something to give, actually. Your vote, if nothing else. Um, you, you have four kids. You want to make sure that those four kids know to walk on the right side of the street when they're going to school, okay? Um, your kid gets into trouble. Hold that kid accountable. You stole from the teacher's desk. <laughs> March him up to the teacher and say, hi, uh, this happened. Um, watch out for your neighbor. I'm not talking about more tax monies right now or whatever I'm saying is something suspicious going on in your neighborhood, okay? Uh, behave yourself, obey the law as, as a starting point. Um, be willing to testify and participate in the criminal justice system, whether to exonerate or to convict. I don't care because remember, our job with badges on ought to be, as your job ought to be, and I think you have the same goal, do justice, undo injustice. Do you think community policing, at least a part of it, is officers being very involved in the communities they serve? Should officers live in the communities that they serve? Um, I worry about that, and here's why. I tell my people, um, don't play cop in your own neighborhood. Um, a lady across the street from my house many years ago, doesn't live there anymore, I don't know where she got to, poisoned my dog. Um, my job was not to go over and talk to her about poisoning the dog or even have a neighbor do it. My job was to get somebody, uh, I wasn't going to get personally involved. My job was to say, if this happened, let's have a neutral party come in. You can't play cop in your own neighborhood or your own family, and you shouldn't be expected to, and it's a bad idea. 
So Chris, what does community policing mean to you and does it work? I agree. It's a slogan. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I think the bigger problem is, is that I think that we don't recognize the police officers are having to enforce laws they may not agree with, right? There's a lot of laws in this state that aren't necessarily obviously about public safety, but the officers have to, they have to enforce them. And Can you give us an example? Domestic violence is a great example. Um, our domestic violence philosophy in the state infantilizes women. It assumes that any woman who has been abused, which is a very broad definition, I've heard advocates say that if your husband has ever lied to you, then you're a survivor of domestic violence because lying is about manipulation. Manipulation is about domination and domination is about control. If your spouse is dominating and controlling you, you are being abused because your husband lied to you about where he was last night. I mean, academically, I can agree with that, but do we want to get the police involved because of, because someone lied? Um, but we have laws on the books that say that if an assault occurred within 48 hours, I believe, of a police officer being called, the officer is required to determine who the primary aggressor is and arrest them and take them into custody. And oftentimes there's absolutely no evidence whatsoever. It's simply a question of who called 911 first. And so you have these cases where both parties called 911 and they just say, okay, well, this one called first, so we're going to arrest that one. I'm sure officers don't feel comfortable with that. And then when they have women saying that they changed their mind and they didn't want this to go forward, tough. I mean, like, you know, I, I have to infantilize you and assume you don't really know what you want and what, what's in your own personal interest and safety because I assume you're being dominated, controlled. I'm sure police officers have a lot of um, negative feelings about that. One thing I thought would be a, a good idea is if we sent marriage counselors to these calls instead with, with officers nearby. But if you could just have a marriage counselor come in there and say, are you willing to voluntarily leave this house for 72 hours? If so, the police will not show up again, right? You know, um, that would make less workload for you. It would perhaps promote more trust that law enforcement isn't the problem, but it's the solution. And you'll also get more assaulted marriage counselors. Well, sorry, this is the same question we have around social workers and such too, right? We're sending them out on the front lines in hopes of de-escalating things, but what if they can't? And they're in harm's way. De-escalation is a, a choice that people make. Um, I like the idea of, is, I see nothing wrong with in, involving mental health workers and, and social workers um, in unison in cooperation with law enforcement as opposed to, is opposed to separately. This idea that if I teach you some things, I'm going to be able to de-escalate you. So we've talked about a softball, community policing. Let's talk about defunding the police. I've heard uh, you, Paul, say that, look, a lot of these initiatives that would make communities more safe take money. And this comes at a time when money in many jurisdictions is being taken from the police. What is the defund movement and does it work? I think the defund movement is um, mostly defunct. And I think, um, I think there are still people who raise the slogan but in fact, it's not happening that much. Why? Look at Seattle. Um, Seattle was burning down police precincts several years ago, right? And declaring a police-free zone because, and now police, uh, now Seattle is trying to give thousands of dollars to people to grow their police department. Well, I will say, so I'm a student at Seattle University, and there's a class on abolishing policing and abolishing jails. I, I don't know, it may not be a strong movement, but it's alive. Well, um, you, you have to control for the fact that um, uh, there are academics in the world, and uh, sometimes they're simply unplugged. People say, well, slave, slave catchers are the origin of policing. No, they're not. And that's taught in universities. No, they're not. And all you have to do is go to the Encyclopedia Britannica. You don't even have to go to the internet. You can go to more primitive things that will show you that, no, there were constables, wardens. Um, um, Back in Roman times, they had police force. It was you know, from the military, but yeah, they had a police well, force. In, in, in America, yeah. from the time the pilgrims landed, uh, there were things. Now, were there slave police? Yes, there were. Were they sometimes uh, blessed and governmentally? Yes, mostly they were private security, though. Um, did they do horrible things? Oh, yes. But let's get real. <laughs> and one of the things that causes mistrust of police is not being real. Chris, in your view, how would you describe the defund movement to somebody who's never heard of it, not familiar with it, 
and uh, and does it work? I, I think it's derived from a abolitionist movement that believes that the real reason that all these that, that people become criminals is because of um, poverty and stuff of that nature. And um, if we just provided services to these people, um, you know, that there would there would be no criminality. I don't believe so take money from the police, give it to services, right. of various kinds. And, and again, I come back to I believe that uh, poor people don't disproportionately commit crimes. I just believe they're disproportionately policed. I think that we have a social, you know, I think that, you know, racism is real. Class warfare is real. Sexism is real. And it needs to be viewed, but it doesn't negate the fact that we need police That's or that we need these institutions. Should we be concerned about embezzlement and white collar crime? Yes. Uh, the idea that poverty causes crime suggests that there, uh, there aren't rich people who are not stone crooks. Right. Um, and we should be dealing with them too. But street policing mm -hmm. usually can't get those kind of criminals. It's not organized to get those kind of criminals. Right. Um, should it be? I don't disagree with anything you just said there. I do think the society prioritizes violent crime, and that's why we have to. But I do think that because we have... Well, that's my question. Is it a good thing? I, I, I think that if you have someone on the street who's committed a murder, yeah, you should intervene by taking them into custody. What should happen to them thereafter is a broader discussion. But you don't want someone who is, you know, just shot three people because they said they were from Russia to just be given a marriage counsel or anything of that. So nature. do we want police disproportionately placed in those places that have higher rates of violent crime? There has to be. The, the moral thing to do is that. So, Chris, do you agree that we should disproportionately place police where there's higher rates of violent crime? You know, I think that it makes sense to put police um, where neighborhoods are asking for it. I think that the more calls you have is an indication of where police should go. Neighborhoods that have disproportionate law enforcement presence are going to have more arrests regardless of what's actually happening out there. I'm, I'm convinced that if I were to go down this street, this is a pretty nice neighborhood here, and search through people's houses, I could find something to charge every single one of them with. If you're watching this at home and you want really good information, follow Chris, follow Paul. We'll post their uh, links in the show notes. Thank you for listening. Thank you for being part of this ongoing conversation. And thank you to you both for what you do. Thank you.